Okay, folks, I am drinking liberal tears today. You can just taste the salt that is pouring out of Twitter right now because the Mississippi Supreme Court has rendered a decision that is making the liberals there apoplectic. Uh, now, it is a decision that's made by a Republican-majority Supreme Court, but it is a good and right decision that even though it doesn't produce the results that you know, even I would like to see, it's still correct according to the law, which is what matters. You only get to see examples of this like once in a blue moon. So I, I wanted to put together a presentation on this to show you the power of a bad law, a badly written law, and the restraint that the judiciary rightfully shows when confronted with a badly written law. So let's take a look at the facts of the case. So the facts are that Mississippi voters have, there are multiple ways of amending the Mississippi state constitution. One of them is much like a process that our Congress uses in which you have to have a two thirds vote in each house and then you know that, that uh, goes out to the districts or something like that. But there is also a means where the constitution can be amended by a ballot initiative. So the people at large can vote on a ballot initiative and amend the state constitution directly. They essentially bypass con their, their state congress, their state legislature. And this is kind of uh, akin to the Article 5 convention method, uh, but not quite. I mean, it's just basically you propose a ballot initiative that then gets placed on the voting ballot in the next election and the voters just vote directly on it. So it is an alternate method, much like an Article 5 convention, that bypasses the state legislature so that the people can get their will done. Now, an initiative was placed on the ballot this year approving medical marijuana. So if this measure passed, then the Constitution would be amended so that medical marijuana would be allowed. 73% of Mississippi voters approved the initiative. They voted for this on the ballot, and therefore it was approved. A highly, highly popular ballot initiative. 73% of voters. It's a very, very popular initiative that they voted on and approved, and it was successful. But the Supreme Court just overturned the initiative, claiming that Mississippi's ballot process is invalid due to census redistricting that dropped Mississippi's numbers of dis number of districts from five to four. Okay, so previously Mississippi had five congressional districts because of their population, but when the census uh, recorded the new population of the United States and found the population in each of the states, they found that in the proportions, uh, Mississippi only had enough population to warrant four congressional districts. Uh, either that or the, the other uh, districts had, you know, there's 500 and, no, there's 435 representatives in the House of Representatives, and these are the congressional districts that uh, we're, we're talking about. And depending on how the redistricting goes, you could, you know, like in this case, uh, California and New York lost so much population that some of their representatives actually went to Texas. So this kind of whole balancing act takes place throughout the country, and it just so happens that in this case, Mississippi went from five congressmen in the House of Representatives down to four. So that had an impact on their ballot initiative law. And here's what I want you to understand. Now, now, one of the things that I want you to know about me personally is that I support medical marijuana. I do not have any problem with medical marijuana initiatives. However, in this case, the Mississippi Supreme Court was absolutely correct to overturn the initiative, and I'm going to show you why. In order to do that, we have to take a look at the law. Now, the law in this case is Section 273 of the Mississippi State Constitution, which was last updated in 1998. This is the law that defines their ballot initiative process. This is the law that basically says, okay, here's what you need to do in order to get in a uh, constitutional amendment onto a ballot, and then voted on by the people. So the first thing it says is, an initiative to amend the Constitution may be proposed by a petition signed by a number of voters equal to at least 12% of the votes for all candidates for governor in the last gubernatorial election. So let's just sum that up and say, let's say that 
A million people, in the last time there was a gubernatorial election, a million people voted for governor. Doesn't matter for who, Just it's just that when they counted all the votes, they counted a million votes for governor. Okay, so you need then 12% of a million vote or uh, signatures in order to get a initiative onto the ballot to be voted upon. So 12% uh, of 1 million people would be 120,000 signatures that you would need to collect from uh, all of the congressional districts to put on the ballot. But there's also another provision. It says voter signatures from any congressional district shall not exceed one-fifth of the total number of signatures required to qualify an initiative petition for placement upon the ballot. What does that mean? Well, that basically means that you need to get one-fifth of the signatures from each of your five congressional districts. You don't want a ballot that is only supported heavily in, or you don't want a initiative to go on the ballot that is only heavily supported by one or two or three or even four congressional districts. They want this to have something with statewide appeal. So you can't just say, okay, I got 120, uh, 120,000 signatures, and they're all from districts one and two. There were no, there were no votes for this from district three, four, and five. Well, no, that, that's not an initiative that can get on the ballot because you don't want one and two overriding the will of three, four, and five. You have to prove that you have the voter, uh, the will of the people uh, submitting this initiative in all five congressional districts. So you need to get 24,000 signatures, at least, in each congressional district to total up to that 120,000 signatures. And now, the last, uh, the last little bit is that excess signatures from a congressional district shall not be considered. Which means, let's say you have uh, District 1 and you cough up 50,000 signatures to put the initiative on the ballot. Well, you can only count that as 24,000 signatures. You cannot count anything above 24,000 towards this. Because if you could, then that would be the case where I had just said, you know, oh, well, you know, districts 1 and 2 wanted this, but districts 3, 4, and 5 really didn't. So the only thing that matters really is the first 24,000 signatures that come out of any congressional district. Now, why does this matter, you know, then versus now? Well, it, it has to do with the number of Mississippi districts. See, back in 1998, you remember I said this law was last updated in 1998. Well, what did Mississippi look like district-wise in 1998? Well, they had five congressional districts, and there are the five right there. Now, what do they have? They have four congressional districts. They lost a congressional district, and therefore, the, the math comes out different. And I'll show you the math. So let's go over the math. In 1998, here's how the math would look. You had a million people vote for governor, okay? You need 12% of a million, which is 120,000 signatures, okay? You need 120,000 signatures to get your initiative on the ballot. Now, you need one-fifth of 120K, uh, which is uh, 24,000 signatures, in each of the five congressional districts. So one-fifth of this 120K to qualify the initiative for the ballot has to come from a single congressional district. And you have to repeat that five times, once for each congressional district. So let's say you got 50,000 votes in every congressional district. Now remember, that 50,000 in each congressional district is capped at a maximum of 24,000. Only the first 24,000 votes in each congressional district count. So let's say that 50,000 voted in each, you cap that total in each congressional district, and you get 24,000 times five congressional districts equals 120,000 uh, signatures. Congratulations, you're on the ballot. But how does that work today? Well, the first couple of parts are, are not any different. You get a million people voting for governor. That still means you need 120,000 signatures from all five congressional districts, which means you need 24,000 signatures to come from each congressional district. But let's say you get 50,000 votes in each of the four congressional districts, and you have to cap that still at 24,000 because 
The law literally says you have to take one-fifth of, of, of the votes needed and cap each congressional district at that. Well, if you cap each of the four congressional districts at 24,000, the most votes you can ever get is 96,000 votes. That's 24,000 times four. But you need 120,000 in order to get on the ballot. So, sorry, you're not on the ballot. You can't get on the ballot because there is no way when you're capping the, uh, each of the four districts that are remaining at one-fifth of the total that you could ever get to a, a full number of signatures needed. The most you will ever get is four-fifths. So the impact of the loss of the congressional district and how the ballot law interacts with that is that no Mississippi initiative can get more than four-fifths of the signatures needed to place it on the ballot, which means the ballot initiative method of amending the Mississippi Constitution is dead in the water. The people cannot amend the Constitution anymore. They can't. There's no path to them now for an amendment to get on the ballot. The only way that they can ever amend the Constitution from this point forward is if the, uh, it, it happens through the other path, which is the legislator. The legislature does it. You know, you get two thirds in the uh, Mississippi House and two thirds in the Mississippi Senate, and they put that on the ballot, and then people vote on it, or whatever that method is. But the the means by which the people were able to directly amend the Constitution and bypass the legislature that's dead. That is dead. And even more important, if there was any Mississippi ballot initiative that was approved by voters under the current four district structure, where Mississippi only has four congressional districts, all you have to do is challenge it in court and it is null and void. It is null and void because that's what just happened now. The mar medical marijuana initiative was challenged in court. They said the ballot initiative process is invalid. The Supreme Court said, you're right. It is invalid, and therefore this ballot initiative was wrongfully put on the ballot. It is null and void. And that can happen to any ballot initiative that was uh, approved to be placed on the ballot under the four district structure. Now, I don't know what's actually out there that uh, could be voided under, by a court challenge under this, but, uh, but it, uh, who knows? It could be a lot. It could be a lot. So what is the solution to this problem? Now here is where Democrats and Republicans diverge. And, and they diverge in such a way that it marks a, a plain misunderstanding on the Democrats' part on what a court is for. And it marks a sharp understanding on the Republicans' part of what a court is for. And that is why I wanted to make this presentation. Because really, the Democrats and Republicans have different views on what the courts are supposed to do within our structure of government. And the Democrats, their response to this whole situation is, well, the judges should have interpreted one-fifth to mean one over the number of congressional districts. This is thwarting the will of the people. And, you know, you can just taste the salt coming off of them. Their view of the law is that if you think you know what the legislators should have put in the law, then you get to replace whatever is in the law with what you think should be in the law. See, in, the, in this case, and you know, it's funny because they could be right about what the legislators meant. The legislators could have been under the impression that, uh, you know, we're, we're always going to have five congressional districts, and so we're going to write it as one-fifth. But, you know, we just assume that, you know, judges later on, if we ever gain or lose any congressional representation, that they'll, they'll understand to interpret it, you know, as a flexible number. But that's not what you do when you're writing a law. A bad law is one that you just expect people to understand later on, and you don't spell out the details. Or when you spell out the details, you spell out these details in such a way that you fix the meaning of the law in a way that you don't want it fixed for later generations. So whichever happened here, we can't even really be sure. We can't even really, be, in fact, I think it was the Republicans on the Supreme Court who argued, we don't know if they meant this to be a tripwire, as, as if to say, if we ever drop below 
five congressional districts, then we don't want the people to be able to amend the Constitution directly anymore. Who knows? And that's exactly the right kind of response. Who knows? The only thing that matters is what the law says, and the law literally says you have to take one-fifth of the total no matter how many congressional districts you have. Which, you know, if, if Mississippi were ever to get six congressional districts, then that would mean that it would be a reduced number of, uh, or a reduced percentage of what would normally be needed on the, uh, on, on, uh, to, to get a, uh, from each congressional district to get a ba uh, ballot initiative placed on the ballot. So, you know, it's something that could work either way. It could actually work to make it easier to amend the Constitution through this method if Mississippi were to go up to six or even seven congressional representatives. But, you know, less than five, it just doesn't work at all. So this is basically what the Democrats are saying, you know, that, well, they should have known. The, the judges should just know that uh, what the legislature meant was one over the number of congressional districts and they should have interpreted the law that way because otherwise the law becomes unworkable. And the Republicans say, tough crap. If the legislators meant one over number of congressional districts, then they should have written that. But they wrote one-fifth. So it's one-fifth. If you don't like it, change the law. And this this right here is the separation of powers that is inherent in our Constitution, that is inherent in all of our Constitution, our state constitutions. It is not the job of the judiciary to change a bad law. That is the job of legislators. Legislators make and change laws. The only thing that the judiciary is supposed to do is interpret the laws to see if you know any conflicts with various other laws can be resolved. This isn't even conflicting with another law. This is just basically, here are the facts. The facts say you need one-fifth of all the votes from each particular district. You can't get there. You can't get to a winning total if you have less than five congressional districts. It's just a bad law. It's not the job of judges to rewrite a bad law. That is the job of legislators, no matter what the result is. Like I said, I have no idea how many ballot initiatives could be challenged and could be overturned by people bringing legal challenges in court according to this same reasoning. You could wind up have, wreaking complete havoc with the system. But you know what? So what? And that is exactly the attitude that judges are supposed to have. They are not supposed to look at the consequences of how the law works and what it says in terms of that if the law says a specific thing. And in this case, you cannot get any more specific than you will take one-fifth of the total you need and require that of each congressional district. You can't get more specific than that, and it is not the job of the judges to fix that for the legislature just because that legislature wrote a bad law. And I love this. I love this so much. And, and if you want um, another example of uh, people interpreting laws and, and rules just like this, please go back and take a look at what, what is actually my most popular video on YouTube. It's called, Do You Even Know What a Court Is For? And uh, you will get another example. This one was from the Texas Supreme Court of a case in which the uh, uh, the court just basically said, you know, no, you can't you can't just do what you want because the people want it, not if it's against the law. And in this particular case, same thing, same exact thing. I salute, I salute the Mississippi Supreme Court for making such a clear-headed and correct and right judgment concerning this law, even though, even though I would much rather the people of Mississippi have access to medical marijuana. So I'm not against the, the thing that this initiative was trying to call for, but I'm very, very much more for the system of separation of powers that these judges chose to respect because if we don't have a good system, if we don't have a clear system, then no matter the loftiness of our goals, America is going to fall apart. I'm glad the Republicans know that. I wish the Democrats would learn that. 
I'm Mike Partika. Thank you for watching this presentation. If you found it valuable, please do hit the subscribe button. And uh, also, you can check out some of my work on Amazon. I've got a link to my ebooks in the uh, video description. Uh, we'll see what, uh, what more developments will come out of Mississippi and maybe the rest of the country after, uh, after a while. Uh, thank you for listening to this presentation, and I will talk to you later.